Like this right here. Turn to number 285. 285, please stand. Two hundred eighty-five, and we'll sing on all three verses. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. A lily of the valley, in Him alone I see all I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow He's my comfort. In trouble He's my stay. He Tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of my the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my grief has taken and all my sorrows won. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him for Satan and all my idols torn from my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Tips me soar through Jesus, I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright light. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing not to fear. With his manna, he my hungry soul shall be Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed day, where rivers of delight shall never Hallelujah. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Good evening, Bible Baptist Church. I'm so glad to see you all here tonight on a Wednesday evening. I am excited for tonight. I don't know why, but I'm just pumped up and ready to go tonight. So I hope I can give you guys some of my energy tonight, and I hope we start feeling it all together. But we're so glad to see you all here tonight. Let's go ahead and pray and get right into the evening. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for being so good to us and for loving us. And thank you for coming and dying on the cross for us 2,000 years ago. Please be with the evening and night. Be with the message. Help us to get something from it. And so I pray, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, here's a good song to sing at tax time. Number 235, He Set Me Free. 235, please. He set me free, he set me free. Once like a bird in prison I dwelt, no freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came and listened to me, and glory to God, he set me free. Well, he set me free. A prison for me. Well, I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see. For glory to God, He set me free. Now I am climbing higher each day. Darkness of night has drifted away. My feet are planted on higher ground. And glory to God, I'm homeward bound. He set me free, he set me free, he broke the bond of prison for me. Well, I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see, for glory to God, he set me free. Goodbye to sin and things that confound, not all the world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working, I'm praying to and glory to God, I'm going through. He set me free, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see. For glory to God, he set me free. Amen. Aren't you glad he set you free? He broke the bonds. I can't think of the words, but he broke the bonds. And uh, 
Glory to God, he set me free. All right, let's go ahead and see if we have any first-time visitors in the house tonight. If we have any first-time visitors in the building tonight, would you go ahead and raise your hands up high? We'd be able to get a card with some chocolates in it. Uh, so if you're visiting the church for the first time, our ushers will give you a card that you can fill out. So go ahead and raise your hand up high, and we'll be able to get you a card that you can fill out. And I don't see any first-time visitors in the building tonight, so Miss Paulette looks like it's just us chickens here tonight. Now it is time for scripture songs, if Randa would like to come on up here. <clears throat> we're going to be going over the new one we just learned on Sunday night, and then we're going to do the three ones I think we're all very familiar with. But the new one, I felt like we didn't get it too good on Sunday night, but it was better than when we started, obviously. So I feel like we can get that one down pretty good tonight. We can get that energy pumping. Everyone, let's stand up. Get that energy pumping in tonight. Get excited for the evening. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We're going to sing this one out loud. If you don't remember it, try to listen. Uh, for anyone around you who might know it, I'll try to sing it as best I can without sounding bad. Whenever rain is ready. For God hath not given to us a spirit. There we go. Our piano player forgot how to play. We're good. Here we go. Here we go. God hath not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. All right, let's go through it again. That actually was pretty good. I'm proud of you all. So let's go through it again. I think we got this one down. Here we go. <coughs> For God hath not given. One more time, sing it out loud, here we go. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Very good, you all already got that one down good, so very good. Let's go ahead and go on to the next one, Proverbs 17:22. Like I said, I'm feeling pretty energetic tonight. I feel like this one always gets the good energy pumping. So let's sing it out loud, sing it with a smile on our face. Here we go. <clears throat> Everyone has a merry heart tonight. Let's go ahead and go on to the next one. Uh, Psalm 119, 97, 101, 103, and 105. This is the one where I say the first part, and then we repeat, oh, how. And then we all sing together, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And then we go into the chorus. Here we go. <coughs> oh, how. Oh, how. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Sing it again. Here we go. Thank you. 
sing one more for the night uh, John 17 3 <clears throat> it's the newer one that we learned the men sing the, uh, their part and the ladies sing the hallelujah part the energy isn't exactly top-notch yet I'm not feeling that we're at the peak level yet so let's get the energy really good during this song sing it out loud sing with a smile on our face ladies sing your part men sing your part here we go and this is life eternal I'm feeling good now. Listen to that one one more time. Sing it out loud. Sing it with a smile on your face. Here we go. And this is life eternal. Very good singing, everyone. You may be seated or stay standing for hands. Yeah, you probably better stay standing because we're going to sing a verse of 394. We're going to shake hands for 14 minutes. 14 minutes. 394, please. 394. Blue book, this book. This book. Blue book. Mm, this. Whoa. That's not the right one. You got two of these? No, I looked for two. This is it. That's it. This is it. That's it. That's it. That's it. It's a little bit different. It'll be alright. This world is not my home. I'm only passing by. My treasures and my hope are all up in the sky. My friends and loved ones wait who told the way before. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, dear Lord, what would I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Greet one another.
All right, 394 of Blue Book, verse number, uh, verse number four. Here we go, verse four, 394. I won't have long to stay. My work is nearly done. I'm happy now to say my race is almost run. So long my eyes are set on heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend. If heaven not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Thanks and be seated. Well, after hearing y'all clap hands, I agree with Josh Lado. This church is too white. We've got to we've got to get some more rhythm in this church because y'all were really off. I don't know much about notes and parts, but I do know rhythm. Man, y'all rhythm was real bad tonight, man. No offense. Isn't it good to come to church on a Wednesday night and shake hands and see familiar faces and be encouraged? I'm glad we can come to a place of truth because last night, 24 hours ago, they said we're going to get three to five inches, and um, once again, they were wrong. I'm glad when we open the Bible. I'm glad when we open the Bible, it's never wrong. Amen. Great to see everybody here. A couple of uh, things. I do think there's a little bit of bitterness in this auditorium tonight. We have a, a coffee on the screen. It, could, it actually could look like a cup of tea. I don't know if Loretta Mitchell's here tonight, but Loretta Mitchell kindly sent me a video that said if coffee advertisers were truthful with their, with their audience, and this man exposes coffee for what it really is. And I just try to be a concerned pastor and share it with some of the church members, and they seem to have gotten offended by it, and now they're <laughs> harassing me with pictures of coffee. But I will stand for the truth no matter what. I just want you all to know that. So let's find out again how many of you love coffee in here. How many of you love coffee? You, gotta, you can't imagine going on the rest of your day without your cup of coffee. How many of you just need Jesus? That's all you need is Jesus. All right, that's what I thought. All I need is Jesus. All I need. And bananas, yeah. I'll take a banana any day over coffee. I'll take a rotten banana over coffee. Amen. But uh, praise the Lord. Great to see everybody here this evening. I, I feel burdened about this. Brother Andy Moore gave texted me last week after the, the message on the Lord's Supper and just kind of gave me a little challenge without even realizing it. He said, man, that was a good doctrinal message on the blood, doctrinal message. And I feel led tonight to teach a little bit of doctrine. Even though this is the Wednesday night crowd, I just, from things I've heard and the confusion that's out there tonight, I want to I show you biblically where we believe about baptism again. Uh, baptism is probably... I'd say, it's, I, I did some research this week, top three or four reasons people will end up going to hell because they believe baptism is going to save them. Right. Baptism is going to definitely be in the top three or four. I, I even heard of Hollywood uh, actor and actress recently that, that, I can't remember who it was, but they talked about how they have to get that, their, their newborn child baptized. And I thought, it's so tragic because their lifestyle is nothing that reflects the glory of God. They need Jesus, I, I get that. But they, they thought to themselves, I've got to get my baby baptized. And they get that false assurance. And uh, I want to just teach you a couple things about that. Maybe some of you aren't aware of this, but there's actually seven baptisms in the Bible. There's seven different baptisms in the Bible. And we're going to find out which one we believe. And did you know that our baptism was different than John's and it's different than Jesus' baptism? And you'll see that in just a second. And we'll show you that from the Bible so you can see and understand. It would be a blessing. Uh, actually, we're supposed to read the scriptures right now. That's right. We have a missionary letter. We have mission. Did we get the copies worked out, Miss Paulette, Miss Nikki? Okay, good. So we'll, I guess we'll read it at the end of service tonight. I'll read it at the end tonight, so we can get the kids to their class. Um, let's go ahead and read our scriptures. Let's go take our Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter number 28. Uh, pray for me. I fly out this Friday morning. And I'll be preaching in Tucson, Arizona area, a big youth conference. I'll be with Brother Judah, so that'll be fun to see him. Maybe get an update on his dad. Hopefully, I can tell you about that Sunday. And then he and I will be preaching together Friday night and Saturday morning. Then I'll fly back Saturday night, be here Sunday. So I'll be praying for that. And then a week from tonight, we will be traveling to, many of us will be traveling to Hammond, Indiana for the basketball tournament. Our varsity boys will be participating in a basketball tournament. And we will be going to Pastor Clark's church in Bridgeview a week from tonight. And our young men will be singing for their church. And Pastor Clark has asked Grant to preach. So the young men are going to do everything next Wednesday night. We just get to sit back and enjoy their singing and preaching. It'll be fun. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. That's a week from tonight. So having said that, Don Koontz is going to preach. He got a burden about a message on prayer. So going back to the doctrines of things, and he'll be preaching on that next Wednesday night. So 
you'll be in good hands and uh, either Braille or Miss Stacey will interpret for the deaf, so that'll be great. All right. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 20, verse 19. Go ye therefore, Jesus speaking here, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I want you to look at that again. Go ye therefore, comma, that's first, go, and teach all nations, comma, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's significant. And then it's a continual thought. There's a semicolon, so there's a little bit longer pause. But then it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And Lord, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Great to see everybody here tonight. I sure appreciate y'all. We're here the special. Dismiss the kids and get the message from that. Thank you. Why do I fear what's ahead? I remember what you said. You promised me that you would be everything I need. You love me more than I am worth you give me more than I deserve for all you do all you brought me through I owe everything to you you bless me over and over again with mercy grace and love I could thank you over and over again but it would never be enough it would never be enough There's no one else, Lord, you're the one Who takes the world and moves it around the sun Makes gray skies blue, makes all things new And cares for me the way you do Bless me over and over again with mercy, grace, and love. I could thank you over and over again, but it would never be enough. It would never be enough. And when I'm faced with the unknown, I trust in you and you alone. No matter what tomorrow brings, still the King of Kings came to me to take me as his own you bless me over and over again with mercy grace and love i could thank you over and over again but it would never be enough it would never be it would never be it would never be
I remember that the gym is still closed uh, because the bleachers are coming in. It's, it's coming along. I also want to thank uh, Miss Jennifer. Oh, Miss Jennifer is Brother Mark. She was here. Maybe she's in the nursery. And uh, Brother Thad for, and Marcy for working on the youth center. It looks a lot better. So if you get a chance, walk on downstairs. Uh, well, by Sunday, uh, the bleachers should be done by Sunday, right? The bleachers should be done, Brother Tim, by Sunday. So I hope you'll be able to see. What a blessing. And the building, well, I think, will be officially complete, right, Brother Tim? Is that the last thing we're waiting on is the bleachers, right? Oh, and the framed life-size picture of Tim Klink against the wall. That's coming in the next month, so we're looking forward to that. That'll be a blessing, okay? All right. Okay, first of all, let's, let's, let's go real quickly to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Oh, I'm sorry, kids, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Robbie. Great song. Thank you, kids. Go ahead. You're dismissed, kids. First, let's take our Bible and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. I'm just going to uh, start off with this because this is a significant verse for us to understand where we're going tonight. So I obviously took the study of baptism very personal after salvation because I was sprinkled as a baby and then baptized multiple times through my young years and even teen years. And so when I finally got saved... And I heard about the subject of baptism again, it made me nervous. So, I, I mean, I've been baptized, I told, like five or six times in my life. Um, only one of them really meant what the Bible means for it to meant for me, and it was a blessing. And so tonight I want to talk about that subject. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. The Bible says this, study, this is a command of the preacher, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. This next phrase is a very significant verse. It says, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that is a very important uh, a very important component of understanding the Bible. And oftentimes you, you hear this statement and it's so true. The Bible is all the whole Bible is written for us, but it's not written to us. Okay? There's a difference there. Uh, my wife may get a, a letter from somebody, a kind card. And it's directly to her. Um, I can still benefit from reading it, but it wasn't to me. I mean, sometimes that blesses my heart to know that somebody was a blessing to her. And I get a nice letter from somebody. I'll take a picture sometimes and send it home to my wife. And she'll read it. And it was written to me, but it was a blessing to her. And so she was able to enjoy it. And so we got to understand that right off the bat. And some people get nervous when you say that, but don't be nervous. I mean, we're not commanded to not eat of a tree right now. We also are commanded, not commanded to not eat bacon. How many are glad for that? I mean, thank God you can eat bacon with a clear conscience tonight. You can go home tonight and fry up some bacon and sleep well tonight. I mean, Peter was just, just horrified just at the thought of eating the unclean in Acts chapter 10. So it's a significant thing to understand that. So let me, with that in mind, let me just introduce to you a couple things. First of all, Make sure you understand the dispensations of the Bible. Um, God's audiences change. There were pre-nation Jews, and then God dealt with the nation of Israel. And now, right now, he deals with the church. And uh, thank God for that. And as we read the Bible, it helps so much when you understand that. But here's the depth and the power of the Word of God. Uh, you have stories of the Bible, but you also have doctrines of the Bible then you also can make so many life applications. For example, the story of David and Goliath, a Jewish young man fighting for the Jewish nation of Israel, the armies of Israel, against a Gentile enemy, and he defeats him. All right, That's the story. That's a biblical story that really happened. We believe that tonight. But there's so many life applications you can take from that, especially when preaching to teenagers. Many pastors and preachers have preached through the years from David killing Goliath, all right? So there's seven biblical baptisms. I'll give you to you seven real quickly. Number one, there's the baptism of Moses. I'm not, I don't have time to get into all of my, I'm going to pique your interest and you can study themselves. The baptism of John. The baptism of Jesus. Uh, trivia question. How many people were baptized in the baptism of Jesus? One person. Right. Good. I'm glad. Good job. Good job, class. Number four, there's the baptism of fire. And number five, there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Number six, there was the baptism of the cross. And then number seven, there's the baptism of the believers. All right? Now, 
Having said that, let me just throw something out for you to think that helps, to think about that help us as we study the subject and as we deal with people in this world. If it was really a big deal, Jesus would have talked about it more. All right, let me give you an example of that, okay? There are numerous denominations that put so much emphasis on speaking in tongues, all right? Some think tongues are just a gift, but not essential for salvation. Some believe if you've never spoken tongues, you are lost and on your way to hell. Yeah, but I've already received Christ. It doesn't matter. You have to have evidence of salvation by Christ by speaking in tongues. So I often ask the question, did Jesus ever speak of tongues? He did not. When he was teaching about the Holy Spirit, he did not speak of tongues. He gave us the Holy Spirit's role and purpose, which is to be a comforter and a guide in this world into truth and all things pertaining to truth. That's what Jesus, that's how Jesus, for lack of a better term, hyped the Holy Spirit. That's how he built up the Holy Spirit for us. Now, that's a whole other message. And if you're curious about tongues, study it out, tongues. It is a biblical doctrine. It is a biblical activity. And there was a reason for it. Um, in Acts chapter 2. In fact, biblically speaking, you are witnessing tongues tonight because we are preaching in two languages so that two uh, cultures can receive the word of God. That is the biblical intent of tongues. It's so important to find out biblical intent over man's motive or reason, okay? Having said that, I ask you, I challenge you to look as Jesus was teaching of himself talking about his sacrifice, hinting to the crucifixion, talking about his life, you'll see that Jesus does not mention baptism. Uh, well, he gets baptized by John. We'll get to that in a second. And then he mentions it when he gives us the Great Commission. But throughout his earthly ministry, he did not speak of baptism a whole lot. Why? Because he's emphasizing himself as Savior. He said he is the way, the truth, and the life. He said, he is the bread of life. And he told a religious leader, ye must be born again. And he does not mention baptism in that chapter. Why is that significant? Because if Jesus talks about something, it's really worth paying attention to and finding out what he's teaching about that subject. All right, so we live in a world today where so many people stalk all their spiritual salvation in baptism. And a lot of times you can ask somebody, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And the first response they'll say is, I got baptized, and they fill, fill in the blank. I got baptized. I got baptized. And it's, it's a blessing to, to hear that. And I always congratulate them. You have to be kind about it. I say, that's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. When did you get saved? Just ask them a nice question. And it's amazing how many times I say, well, and boy, you can just see the look of doubt on their face. A sincere person will realize it's different than baptism. And I believe the reason they respond that way is because they know in their heart of hearts, and they're all by themselves, they knew something wasn't completed. Because here's the deal, church. When it's all said and done, when anybody says you got to speak in tongues to get saved, or you got to get baptized, or you got to be a good person, to me, it is an insult to what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. It is saying that what Jesus did on Calvary does not suffice God's demand for judgment and wrath. And we know that Jesus did it all. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was saying he, in his sacrificial giving of his own life, was meeting the demands of God's wrath and judgment. All right, so tonight, let's look at just a couple things. Number one, I want you to look at baptisms and dispensations. Baptisms and dispensations, all right? Look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. We'll bounce around the Bible just a little bit tonight. The Bible says, Then went out to him, unto, out to him in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. All right, look at verse number 15 of the same chapter. Same chapter. It says, And Jesus answering said unto him, John the Baptist, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it had become unto us to fulfill all righteousness, then he suffered him. That's when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. All right? Matthew chapter 21, verse 25. 
We'll, we'll tie it all together in just a second. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 25. I want you to notice that Jesus calls it the baptism of John. All right, watch this in verse 25. The baptism of John, Jesus says, whence was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did you not thou believe him? So John's baptism, if you study it out in Matthew in the book of John, required an activity of repentance. It was repentance and the activity of John's baptism. John's baptism is a, maybe a foreseeing of what's to come. And then when Jesus is baptized, Jesus' baptism is different because Jesus did not have to confess sins because he obviously was sinless. That's important to know. Jesus did not have to repent because he had nothing to repent of, right? Now I got a question for you, a very simple question, not a trick question. Did John the Baptist say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? No, he did not. It was an activity for a transitional stage in the Bible to introduce Christ, which is why when Jesus shows up, John the Baptist makes a very powerful statement to start to transition dispensations by saying, Behold, the Lamb of God, which, what? Taketh away the sins of the world. So he's, he's admitting that his baptism was not a part of that, that whole plan. Uh, he, he, or it's a part of the plan, but it's not essential for salvation. In other words, his baptism was comparable to all the activities of the Old Testament. How did Adam and Eve stay? How could they have stayed in the Garden of Eden, right? By believing in Jesus Christ for salvation? No, by not eating of the fruit. You see, you're always, always, all through the Bible, from Genesis, from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22, what it boils down to is this. Man has to be willing to do whatever God tells you to do in that particular dispensation. So it is always faith in what God tells you to do. Now, that comes to us now, baptism. There is a reason. There's a method to God's madness for our baptism. So number one, understand the dispensations. As when it comes to water, you have John's baptism. You have Jesus' baptism. Now you have the baptism of believers, right? I want you to look again in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Again, there's so many people out here. So many people here in Jeff City. And it's a very strong religious town that are believing in baptism as their salvation. And it just breaks my heart because I believe that. I was taught that. And are there verses that make it sound like baptism is essential for salvation? Yes, they are. But you have to look at it in its proper dispensation. All right? There are some that believe it. You could Google right now, are you required to be baptized for salvation? And you'll get all kinds of articles about it. And they sound convincing. But again, I ask you a question. If baptism was so essential, then why didn't Jesus emphasize it more? Jesus does not need any help from a baptismal tank. He does not need help from a preacher. He does not need help from the Pope. He's never needed help from religion. Jesus paid it all. Jesus died on the cross and rose again so that you and I can be saved. So number two, there's a baptism and its purpose for us in the church age. Verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach what? That's salvation. That's being a witness. Teaching them Jesus Christ. Teaching them. That's what missions is all about, but it's really what we're supposed to be doing even still here in 2023. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. I'll tell you what, the Independent Baptist Church has done a good job of soul winning, but not a good job of baptizing and discipling people. We can definitely improve in that area. Teaching people to get baptized the right way, and then teaching them uh, to teach others what we have taught them. So what is the purpose of biblical believers' baptism for this dispensation? All right. It's important that we see that. First of all, I am wearing tonight a wedding ring. This ring I wear publicly for one simple reason. It shows the world that I am what? That I'm married. If I take the ring off tonight, am I still married? I am married. Now, if I call my son up here tonight and I put that ring on his finger, does he all of a sudden become married? He's not married. 
He's not married just because he puts the ring on his finger. He's only married when he gets married first and gets his own ring and puts it on his finger, and then he can demonstrate it by wearing it publicly. I take this ring tonight and put it on Travis Davis's finger or put it on Austin or Toby's or Andrew's finger. It does not mean that they're married. So many people today are confused because they think their baptism is going to cut it and get them to heaven. But being baptized before you are saved or trusting only in your baptism is like a young man putting on a wedding ring who has never been married. And the reason I put this ring on is to show the world what happened one time in my life when I said I do and my wife said I do and we got married. Now I wear this ring to show the world and they know this man's a married man. It's not that difficult to understand. However, so many people, even though they understand that concept, still think that baptism is essential for salvation. Many cultures in this world have marriages without rings, but they're still married. And if I don't wear this ring, it doesn't mean I'm not married. If I never wear the ring the rest of my life, it doesn't change my marriage standing in the eyes of my wife, in the eyes of my family and friends, in the eyes of my God, and even in the eyes of the government. The government does not demand that you wear a wedding ring to prove that you're married. But we put it on as a display of something that happened that really means a lot to us internally. And so that's what baptism is tonight, church. It's so important that we understand that and teach that. Because we live in a world now that, where the devil's got people so duped into believing that they're going to go to heaven someday because they have been baptized. They got wet, but they weren't really baptized. Because baptism, in its proper order, comes post-salvation, never pre-salvation. If you got baptized before you got saved, you just got wet. And I got wet several times. But after salvation, there was a significance there because now we are obeying the process and commission that Jesus Christ gave to us by saying, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it is a public display that shows people, eyewitnesses, what happened inside by salvation. This has been kind of fresh lately because we have quite a few new people joining the church. We have we had a family join this past Sunday. We have one joining this Sunday. And I have two or three other families that have been meeting with me and my wife about joining this church. What a blessing that is. And uh, we have two scheduled to get baptized soon also. And another one to get baptized soon. And uh, that's exciting, all those things. But it's just to hear that concept of baptism again. Is baptism not important? No, it is important. It is a big deal to God. God is for baptism. God likes baptism. God commands us to be baptized. And it is a beautiful display of immediate obedience because we have been saved by his son. And the picture of baptism is beautiful. So that leads me to another thing. I oftentimes when I talk to a child especially, I use the wedding ring analogy more with teens and adults. With children, I have a fun thing where I'll do where I'll, I'll just, I'll get my phone. I'm talking to a kid. I'll say, hey, I'll just say, hey, Who's that right there? And I'll just point. And they'll say, that's your wife. I said, no, that's not my wife. Little kids say, yes, it is. That's your wife. I said, no, it's not. My wife's over there. My wife's in the nursery. My wife, that's just a picture of my wife. And I thank God for pictures. I'm glad I can look at a picture of my wife throughout the day. I'm glad I can look at a picture of my family. Pictures are a blessing. But pictures are not the real thing. In a few weeks, my wife and I are flying to Fairbanks, Alaska. You're a preacher that loves salt water. We'll be in negative 20 degree weather, sleeping during the day, and all night we're hunting for the great aurora. It's this massive green animal that stalks the sky, that pursues you and devours you with its beauty. All right, that was my wife. That's my wife's desire. We, for our 25th anniversary this summer, we, we originally planned to go to Hawaii, and my wife heard that there was still COVID restrictions and she said I'm not taking you to Hawaii when there are COVID restrictions because you will make scenes everywhere and embarrass us. Amen. So we discussed some things out and I chose Florida and we went there last September for four or five days and my wife chose the frozen tundra of Alaska and in a few weeks we're going to go up there and we're going to mush I feel bad for the dog sled that gets me on there, but thank God we're going to get to mush with some dogs, and we're going to see some ice sculptures, and we're going to have a wonderful time. We're going to get to go to the church that influenced us in our scripture singing. We'll be there Wednesday night. I'll see some friends because we've preached it before. And the highlight of the week is every night 
we're going to look for the auroras, the, uh, the northern lights, they call them, right? And Fairbanks is one of the top three or four cities on the planet that, that are known for seeing the northern lights. My friends have been texting me many pictures saying this year is one of the best years ever. And so we're looking forward to that. And my wife is really, really trying to figure out how to get pictures. Miss Janelle wants to get these beautiful pictures, and she's been watching YouTube videos. And, and everything we're reading saying that there's, there's a, for some reason, the way the northern lights are, there's a vast difference between what the naked eye sees and what cameras do with the northern lights. Now, there's many things you can take a picture nowadays, and, and it's very comparable. There's something about the northern lights, they say that, that it just, it just, you just can't, you can't get it exact. Even the highest tech cameras aren't the same as the naked eye. And some argue that the cameras actually do a better job than the naked eye does. We'll find out and let you know. How many of you have seen the northern lights before? How many of you seen the northern lights? A few of you? All right, so we're looking forward to that. Um, I told my wife, I see them every night. You just look north and see lights. There's, I mean, northern lights anyway, so. But we're looking forward to the trip. Because, watch this now, you can take pictures all you want of something, but there's nothing like seeing it really from your own eyes. And so many people are going through the Christian life with a picture of salvation against their breast, or in their pocket, or in their religion, or in the back of their mind, and they look at that picture from time to time, and it comes up at, at, in a religious setting, or they, they discuss and they go back to that baptism, and yet they've never seen real salvation with their naked eye. So salvation comes first. And then we get the beautiful activity of taking a person and baptizing them. And the reason we take them and put them under is it's a beautiful picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The only debate I would have about baptism is maybe since it's supposed to signify the burial, we should hold them underwater just a little bit longer than we do. I thought a good 30 seconds would be good. When the legs start kicking, then rise them up, okay? <laughs> I mean, if you're going to represent the death and burial of Jesus Christ, you might as well go as close as you can, right? I think it was with Wesley when he was little, jumped into the baptistry and splashed everybody and got us wet. That was fun. That made me want to hold him underwater for a little while. <laughs> so, But the point is tonight is, church, listen, we, we know this tonight, but it's important to be reminded, biblically, doctrinally, we have our own biblical, doctrinally given baptism. We have it. We have the baptism doctrine handed to us. And it is an essential step of obedience after salvation that we present to people of, uh, in necessity, not for salvation, but to display the blessing of what Jesus did for you in your heart and when he saved your soul. And the peace of mind of knowing you're going to heaven someday. That, my friend, is the beauty of baptism. And so tonight, when we look at the subject of, of the balance of baptism, I would challenge you to study it out. Acts 2.38 is one of the big controversial ones. I've taught a series on it many years ago. I probably should do it again sometime. Why many people believe Acts 2.38 is a verse that proves that you have to be baptized to be saved. There's other verses. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 is another one. And I can easily explain those verses away to you because they apply to the dispensational truths that God gave to us in his wisdom. So tonight, baptism is a beautiful gift. But it's not the same as the gift of salvation. It is nowhere near the gift of salvation. It is a step of obedience. It is to display to people on the outside something happened to me on the inside. And I'm unashamed to put the wedding ring on. I'm not just going to carry a picture of salvation with me, because that's what baptism is. I got salvation first. I saw the northern lights with my naked eye first, then I snapped the picture. And no matter what happens, 10 years from now when I'm looking at that picture again, it'll still always feel different than when I saw it with the naked eye. So tonight it's so important that we as Christians understand that doctrine. And don't be afraid to educate people that call themselves Christians today of this subject. You know why? Because Randy Dingen wishes somebody would have a lot sooner than they did. God is good tonight. Heads your bad eyes close. Thank you for listening so well. Hello, Pastor Randy Dingman here from Bible Baptist Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. I'm going to take a moment and express to you what our main vision and purpose is of this ministry. You see, much of this world today has a question. It's a question that was asked in John chapter 3 by one person. 
It's a question that is asked by the masses, but when you really think about it, it's really a question we all have to come to grips with, face to face with, one on one in our lives, sometime in our life. The question is this, where will I spend eternity? And that question was asked by a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He approached Jesus Christ in the middle of the night and had a question about spiritual matters. Well, good thing for Nicodemus, he came to the right person at the right time because Jesus Christ is the answer in spiritual matters. You see, many of us have questions about that, and man has tried in many of its efforts to answer that question with their own ideas and philosophies. We've tried to come up with ideas on how to get us to heaven, how to confirm our way to heaven. But the fact is we got to find out what God says about eternal things. And that's why asking Jesus Christ that question is so vital. Because when you ask Jesus a question, you get the answer. And as the question was asked, Jesus answered simply this, you must be born again. In John chapter 3, that's what he said to Nicodemus. And that's the same thing he says to you and to me even today. You see, God is God of this universe, but he's not everybody's father. What does that have to do with John chapter 3? Well, think about this. We all have birthdays. We all are physically born under this physical planet. Or else you wouldn't be able to watch me or I wouldn't be able to sign to you right now or talk to you at this time. But God, being a spiritual being, knew that though our bodies are temporal, our spiritual part of us, our spiritual anatomy of us, is an eternal thing. And so God says, I'm more concerned about the spiritual issues. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and me 2,000 years ago and live again three days later so that you and I can have a spiritual birthday and know for sure that heaven is our home. Well, that leads to the next question. Why do we need a spiritual birthday? Well, it's simple. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law and God's commands. But God loves us so much so that he let Jesus Christ become the substitute for your sin and my sin. So that if we recognize and admit that we are sinners, we can then trust in Jesus Christ as our substitute. And more so than that, our personal Savior and know that on top of our physical birthdays, we have a spiritual birthday now in that God becomes our father, we become his sons, daughters, we become his children, and we know we're going to go to heaven someday. My friend, it's very simple. It's not about what the church says, what I have ideas about, or what you have ideas about. It's finding out what God says directly to you and me. And he did it right there in the Bible, and in particular, John chapter 3, when Jesus says, you must be born again. If our church can help you with that question, if you have any questions about that, we can give you some answers. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Again, Pastor Randy, personally thanking you for watching the message. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. God bless and make it a great day.